It's Monday. It's April 22nd. And the term of the day is kangaroo word, which means a word that contains the letters of a synonym inside of it. Hat tip to Don A for the idea. Used in a sentence, two examples of a kangaroo word are honorable, which contains noble, and also libertarian, which contains liar. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. I'm just glad to hear that kangaroo word wasn't your substitute for a slur about Australians. So it's a weird way to start the show. The the fact that Australian contains stain can't be just a coincidence at this point, can it though? I'm no illusions. I'm Eli Bosnick. I'm Heath Enright. And broadcasting delayed from America's far center, we are the Skeptocrats. On this week's episode, people are dying for loans in Brazil. We'll finally break our silence on history's most fuckable popcorn bucket. And Donald Trump is losing bigly at everything, except for national polling somehow. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah. but first, the rest of the intro music. Joining me for headlines tonight are my fellow Skeptocrats, No Illusions, and Eli Bosnick. Gentlemen, I know we're not religious people, but Passover starts tonight, so happy, really good brisket. And Eli, happy whatever you have. I, was, I, I, I know that the existence of such a state will terrify you, Heath, but I'm actually in the post-brisket phase of my life now, too. Oh, that's so sad. Yeah, I think if we ever suggest a just salad for a company lunch, it may be what tears us apart, so... <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> We can't break it to them. The whole meal can't be a garnish. (laughs) Right. (laughs) In our lead story tonight, the House of Representatives did a thing on Saturday. Like like an actual, tangible, meaningful thing. Not a live action reenactment of a Facebook fight. Not a meritless impeachment attempt on the grounds of forestalling a temper tantrum. Not a national embarrassment of a hearing into whether space aliens are coming for our cattle. But an actual legislative thing with consequences four of them no less so of course there will be hell to pay within the republican caucus yeah and all the bills have names of foreign countries on them which don't really exist on the world map that isolationist republicans have in their head it's just like a flat circle giant usa in the middle ice shelf around the yeah right right exactly so yeah, so this <laughs> Mercator projections like that's a little racist, guys. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so this shocking turn of events came about in response to a direct attack against Israel by Iran. The attack, while mostly thwarted by Israel's air defense system, was a major escalation in Middle East conflict and represented a dangerous threat to the embattled democracy that is already fighting simultaneous wars against journalists, aid workers, and Gaza. And whatever you think of the continuing U.S. aid to Israel, I think we can all agree that it shouldn't be curtailed so that Vladimir Putin can have the Donbass. But that's the state of affairs we were in after joint aid packages for Ukraine and Israel were left languishing in the House for months because the lunatic fringe of the Republican Party can't tell the difference between Russian propaganda and the regular lies that govern their political opinions. So Mike Johnson, the still very terrible, theocratic, dangerously fanatical Christian House Speaker, decided last week to do the unthinkable and allow the overwhelming majority of legislators to democratically decide what we as a nation would do. Because he'd run out of other options. Seriously, he had his guys calling them each other tubby and yelling that they didn't have IQs over 40. And finally, he's like, Phenomenal. fuck it, I'm bringing in the Democrats. <laughs> That's uh, it. That's it. We're doing politics. You're right. Me God no damn choice. it, Matt Gates. Uh, and you are tubby. I'll turn this car around right now <laughs> and do my job. <laughs> right. And do our job. Right. Is that what you want? You want well, politics? And, and look, the only reason Johnson is speaker at all is because his predecessor, Kevin McCarthy, did this exact same thing and got ousted for it. Uh, leading to one of the most embarrassing speaker votes in the history of parliamentary procedure. Well, that was, well, anyway, uh, two of the most embarrassing. Um, but but at least three Republicans, Thomas Massey, Paul Gosar, and Maj Taj Gaj, or Moscow Marge, as she apparently hates to be called, have already threatened to give us a rerun as revenge for this bipartisan betrayal. <laughs> and speaking of MTG, she tried to block the aid for Ukraine by introducing an amendment that would force members of Congress who support the bill to enlist in the Ukrainian military. Yep. It really did. And hoping to block aid to Israel, she introduced an amendment that would divert the funding toward, quote, the development of space laser technology on the southwest border of Hell the United yeah. States. Yeah. <laughs> she yes. wants to shoot immigrants with space lasers. Yeah. And I'm not, like, editorializing or making a joke about her 2018 comments that... 
the Rothschild family was financing laser beams from space to start wildfires in California <laughs> to make money for the Illuminati, although she did do that. She did say that. This week, she said, quote, I've previously voted to fund space lasers for Israel's defense. America needs to take our national security seriously and deserves the same type of defense for our border that Israel has and proudly uses, end quote. So point being, if you don't want the U.S. giving aid to Israel, and that's a very reasonable thing, the way to do that is not anti-Semitic conspiracies about space lasers. No, nope, that's and not the path. <laughs> a plan to shoot immigrants like the centuries from never-ending story. Right. That's yeah, not that's how you do that. It's, it's so silly that you almost lose track of the fact that she wants to shoot immigrants to death with <laughs> the heat rays. Yeah. Well, here's the thing, right? At best, what she's arguing for is a system like the Iron Dome, which Israel does have, and those missiles are laser-guided. But that would still mean she wants to shoot immigrants with, with missiles. missiles. Yes. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> That's just laser guided. It's worse. It's worse. I think it's worse. <laughs> so, now, until this point, Democrats have enjoined all the various aid packages uh, that were on the table because they, they didn't want to vote individually on Ukraine, Israel, and other foreign military aid because they didn't want to give Republicans the chance to just deny Ukraine aid. That's what they would do. Right, because a significant portion of the Republican caucus is under the thumb of the Russian government, including their presumptive presidential nominee. But no. they agreed to vote. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, sorry to <laughs> sorry to break it to you like that. Um, but they agreed to vote on them individually if the votes were bipartisan. And the rule that allowed that to happen was passed overwhelmingly on Friday. Uh, and as a reminder of the relative functionality of the two parties, more Democrats voted in favor of Johnson's rule than Republicans. And this tiny little blip of sanity from Johnson was enough that Democrats might actually support him when the GOP lunatics inevitably try to oust him for doing a thing yes. as his job. Yep. So ultimately they voted on five different bills, a $60 million uh, aid package for Ukraine, a $26 billion bill that included $17 billion in military aid for Israel and $9 billion in humanitarian aid for Gaza and elsewhere, uh, an $8 billion aid bill for Taiwan, and a fourth bill of just insane shit that Republicans wanted, including a TikTok ban. Uh, all of those were passed. There was also the, the fifth bill with crazy border shit in it, but it was structured differently and would have needed a two-thirds vote to pass, which it failed to get. But yes, in order to pass military aid for our allies and humanitarian aid for everyone else, we had to let the Republicans ban fucking TikTok. Okay, so Eli, like, what What do you do now? Right? Just <laughs> parenting? You okay. just parent? Okay, but have you guys ever really watched the first 20 minutes of Cars 36 times? <laughs> it's, I, there's I a lot in the there. I the 36th viewing it gets worse. That's much, when it really, yeah. yeah. That's, That's a what, podcast. Good. So I now like look, later. ultimately... I think it's a good thing all these aid packages passed. Even if you disagree with military aid to Israel, that bill contains a fuck ton of aid money for Gaza that the Republicans were also blocking. But it's also another instance of Democrats swooping in to save the GOP from itself. And as Heath pointed out, there's a good chance that they're going to do so again if the lunatic fringe votes to oust Johnson in retaliation. And as happy as I am that there are ultimately adults in the room, every time Democrats take on that role, they're allowing Republicans to keep being this childish even longer. Right. So that's just something to keep in mind if and when Democrats do draw the line. Okay, but seriously, someone has to save TikTok because I haven't had to think one of my own thoughts in four years, and I have no idea what's been going on in there. Okay, <laughs> so, I don't want to. I don't want to open all that. All right. Up. Well, quick while Eli mainlines some pugs riding skateboards while he still can. We're going to pause for a word from this week's sponsor, Aura Frames. Hey, podcast listener, looking for the perfect gift to celebrate the moms in your life? Aura frames are beautiful, Wi-Fi connected digital picture frames that allow you to share and display unlimited photos. It's super easy to upload and share photos via the Aura app. And if you're giving an Aura as a gift, you can even personalize the frame with preloaded photos and memories. Really? You think that'll make up for all the sketches on Citation Needed? 
from Seriously. grandmothers to new mothers, aunts, and even friends in your life, every mom loves an Aura Frame. Name the best digital photo frame by Wirecutter and select it as one of Oprah's favorite things. Aura Frames are guaranteed to bring joy to moms of all ages. You know what would bring joy to my mom? Right now, Aura has a great deal for Mother's Day. Listeners can save on the perfect gift by visiting AuraFrames.com to get $30 off, plus free shipping on their best-selling frame. That's A-U-R-A Frames.com. Use code Skeptic at checkout to save. Terms and conditions apply. Not being in the schedule. Aura Frames, a great gift and a great apology for making someone into a sex robot. And she dated El Chapo. Mm -hmm. That too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In a sketch. Also in a sketch, yes. And in real life. And we're back. Next up in headlines in Shy Halusi News. <laughs> It might seem a little late to chime what? in on the Dune popcorn bucket, but this week we got an important perspective that's been left out of the conversation for far too long. I'm talking, of course, about the merchandising folks at AMC, and they would like to let us know you hurt their feelings because <laughs> you made their popcorn bucket weird. <laughs> Sorry, just quick question. What? I, all of okay, that. all right. What? So I just I want to retire to whatever joyous and innocent corner of the <laughs> internet that you inhabit, Heath. That's where I want to go when I die. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so for those of you like Heath who aren't so chronically online as myself and have no fucking idea what I'm talking about, let me fill you in. This is why we have to get rid of TikTok. Yeah, <laughs> this is one of the many reasons why <laughs> to celebrate the release of Dune Two. AMC theaters did what they do with a lot of their blockbuster releases, and they premiered a celebratory themed popcorn bucket modeled after one of Dune's iconic sandworms emerging from the earth. What? And that popcorn bucket, Heath Enright, looked like <laughs> That's this. what I'm looking at, a sandworm? Mm -hmm. Are you sure? Yeah. Now, gentlemen, I know we're in an audio medium, so do you want to try to explain for the folks at home who can't Google image this uh, what we are looking at with this uh, We are not looking at a sandworm. We are looking at a glory hole made of a sarlacc yep. is what we're looking at. Yep. No, it, it can't be described better than that, so I'm not going to bother it's, to try. It's real fuckable. It's real <laughs> fuckable. If, you're, if you can't Google, like if you're driving and listening, imagine the most fuckable possible sandworm shaped <laughs> bucket. You didn't do it good enough. You didn't make it fuckable. Even enough. if there's not popcorn on the other side. <laughs> yeah, and fuckable. especially if there is. Anyways, this week at CinemaCon, Variety got to sit down with a panel of theater owners and talk to them about the future of the industry and... Like I mentioned, fuckable popcorn merch. In response to the question, how much does AMC plan to lean into collectible popcorn <laughs> buckets, which I refuse to believe was not a double entendre, this is what the chain's representative had to say. Quote, some fans are collectors. There's another group of people who are specific film fans buying three different Ghostbusters products. It's all a mix. It's a material part of our food and beverage business, but it's not the majority of it. It also makes the movies more fun. It's <laughs> like going home from a concert with a t-shirt. Okay. Well, I mean... <laughs> yeah, you know how it's kind of boring when you fuck your t-shirt into Uber on the way home and you're like, boo, just a boring t-shirt. We fixed it. <laughs> Continuing. There's a lot of creative energy from it. We continue to learn and evolve... We would have never imagined the Dune thing. We would have never created it knowing it would be celebrated or mocked. Wait. And real exact word for word. So <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, wait. So if we'd known how successful it was going to be, we'd have done it differently? I, I have a radical theory. The reason theaters are dying isn't Netflix, guys. Yeah. Yeah, uh, but don't worry. I it think looks, they're lying. Yeah, it looks like AMC is going to try and catch that lightning bolt in a bottle again. Uh, in response to the follow-up question, Saturday Night Live parodied the Dune popcorn bucket. Was that the ultimate seal of approval? The representative said, quote, absolutely. And you couldn't make it happen if you wanted to. It wouldn't be fair <laughs> to pull our creative talent aside to say, we hope. It makes it to SNL. <laughs> we hope you do such a bad job. Yeah. Amazing. Hey, uh, SNL, what objects do you want us to fuck? Like pop, <laughs> pop filter or popcorn? I don't know, just shout them out and we'll do it if you'll do a yep. parody of us. 
please. So, yeah. Will we see more accidentally fuckable merch from upcoming releases like Joker 2? Perhaps. Either way, the ironic folks at Deadpool and Wolverine marketing team have the opportunity to get some amazing publicity for free. Get on it, guys. You're the ones to do it. And in alternative truth social news. Oh, yes. Give it to me, Heath. Just Donald Trump's social media site, Truth Social, is a mathematical dumpster fire and a regular one and a metaphorical one. So we are going to talk about it. It was founded in 2021 after Trump got banned from Twitter following the Capitol riot. And it was launched in 2022. And it's already lost him so much fucking money. Even with a recent rebound in their absurdly overvalued stock price, his net worth is still way down overall. So if you're having a bad day, just remember that regardless of when you're hearing this, Donald Trump is very likely crying right now. Ugly <laughs> crying right now. At any given moment this week, he's probably having a weepy temper tantrum where, you know, he like can't catch his breath and there's ketchup on the wall. It's the best. Yeah, no, at this point, they're just doing all his interiors in dark ketchup red. Yeah. Yeah. Melania's on the phone with Heinz asking them if they do paint buckets, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. And Heinz is like, what the fuck did you just say? I have no <laughs> idea. Pang bokeh. Okay. What? Pang bokeh. Okay. You said the same noise again. That's Pang. nothing. Okay. So I'll start with the Hey, backstory. guys, it's me again. Don't hang up. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the backstory of Truth Social. After getting banned from Twitter in 2021, Trump started a site called From the Desk of Donald Trump to post his nonsense fucking ranting. That got shut down in less than a month. Later that year, though, he announced the creation of Trump Media and Technology Group, the parent company that would launch Truth Social. And despite all Trump's rhetoric about China, the project was financed by a company called ARC Capital with offices in Shanghai and Wuhan. So Trump did COVID. (laughs) And ARC Capital had already been investigated by the SEC for illegal shell company shenanigans, pin in that so in october of 2021 truth social tried to (laughs) they tried to secretly launch in beta but hackers immediately found it and started making fake accounts and fucking with the site and truth social had to shut the whole thing down this is that's two failures the company hadn't started yet the company pre-failed twice yeah yeah (laughs) the idea that donald trump who wasn't able to so much as wetly fart in his entire presidency without 48 hours of cable news television about it thought he could start a secret website (laughs) shows just how isolated from the truth he really is So they finally do an actual launch in February of 2022. And almost immediately, the SEC finds out the whole thing is run by a shady acquisition group called DWAC or DWAC that's financed by ARC Capital. As a result, a Manhattan grand jury puts out subpoenas to the entire board of DWAC and also the Trump Media and Technology Group. Then in March of 2023, The Guardian reports that investigators also found that DWAC violated anti-money laundering laws after taking about $8 million in funding from Russian oligarchs. Eventually, the SEC investigation leads to a penalty of $18 million for lying to the investors, and DWAC ends up losing about a billion dollars that they raised when all their investors pull out as a response to that. That was pretty much all their money at the time. Yeah. Just just stop for a second and think about how many times you could fit all the failures in your life into that amount of money, right? <laughs> it's, like, it's like when they tell you how many Earths would fit into Jupiter or something, and then it, right. and it just gets so much worse from there. So here's the thing. You know how normal people, this doesn't happen to me, but you know how normal people lie there at night and think about their failures? Do you think Donald Trump does that? And if so... Is that why he looks like he hasn't slept since his mail order steak business failed? Right. Yeah. It it turns out he's actually just forty four. Yeah. Right. He's just running out of time. Ah, uh, damn it! Made it to seven a.m. again. All right. Well, here we go. Yeah. Now he just thinks fondly about that steak business and how it was so much better. <laughs> yeah. Than right. the ones he's done yeah. Since. Exactly. Remember when people barely cared that I failed? Yeah. I lost money. Howard Stern talked to me. <laughs> so- My dad was in the KKK. <laughs> <laughs> So now, fast forward to this year. D 
DWAC and ARC Capital and Trump Media cannot agree on anything because the whole Truth Social project is a fucking shit show and it's been constantly losing money since the launch. So everyone has started suing each other in every direction this year. And that's, of course, the perfect moment for an IPO. <laughs> so they did their IPO for Truth Social on March 26th amid all that shit show. It goes very badly. It looked good at the start, closing the first day with the company valued at about $8 billion. But then on April 1st, FEC filings for Truth Social show big losses for 2023 and the stock plummets. And two days later, on April 3rd, we learned that Truth Social got bailed out of bankruptcy by Russian-American businessman Anton Postolnikov. And you'll be shocked to learn that he has been the subject of a long investigation by the FBI and Homeland Security huh. regarding his insider trading and money laundering. Money. It's so weird that literally everyone Trump is in business with also launders money. So what a, what a weird coincidence that the real estate mogul would know so many money launderers by coincidence. <laughs> okay, maybe it's because Donald Trump enjoys passive income that grows faster than the market, gentlemen. I am gentlemen. not Hear me watching in. the TikToks you sent me. We can't afford to not be investing This is right why now. they had to this ban This is why it had to be banned. This is why yep. they had to ban yep. I am the reason Very they Very important. To ban it. Okay, so that brings us up to date. According to the current stock price for Truth Social, it's about $35 right now. The market is somehow valuing the company because of that price at about $4 billion. That's despite those FEC filings that I mentioned that revealed only $4.8 million in revenue last year, along with $58 million in losses. And for anyone who's not a big Wall Street nerd, investors don't typically value a company at 1,000 times the annual <laughs> <Yes>. sales. <laughs> yeah, the price to sales ratio of the average S&P 500 company, which is not Truth Social, that number is about 2.5 rather than 1,000. <laughs> so what you're saying is that Eli should not buy the dip. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> okay, but guys, the rates we get on a small business loan are so reasonable. <laughs> I can put my house up as collateral. I'm running my like, hand down it. your lip. <laughs> they take it. So <laughs> with a company that's extremely overvalued, Lots of investors are going to try to short the stock, meaning they're going to bet on the price going down. They'll borrow the stock from somebody who has it, sell the borrowed borrow shares. The stock from at somebody the who has it. Quiet. <laughs> <laughs> They'll sell the borrowed shares at the current price, wait for the inevitable crash of that price, and then pay back the loan with shares that they buy for way less after the crash. And thanks to the astronomical demand yes. for betting against Truth Social, the cost of getting that loan to carry out the short is literally higher than just about every single stock ever, 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 ever. Normally, the cost of borrowing to short a stock ranges from 0.3% to 3% of the stock price per year. For Truth Social, as of the beginning of April, it costs between 750 and 900% per year to bet against it. And big investors are so confident the company's a piece of shit, they're willing to pay that crazy extra <laughs> amount. So it's official. Donald Trump created pretty much the biggest loser in the history of stock markets. I think so, and yeah. Most of the stockholders, other than Trump himself, are big Trump fans who love supporting a savvy businessman. Yep. Oh, my God. At least the red hats kept pigeon shit off your head, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Here's my favorite part. So I haven't been following everything in the news about Trump recently, but as I understand it, he could use a little money right now. I just huh, like kind oh. of vaguely picked that up. And he owns about 58% of the stock for Truth Social, which would sell for way more than its actual value of, well, approximately zero. But... Thanks to federal regulations about IPOs and also a lockup deal in Trump's contract, he has to hold his 
piece of shit stock for at least six months. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, you know, he doesn't incur any big debts between now and then, uh, or he might have a bad time. Yeah. Hopefully the stock doesn't also all the way crash during that time. Uh, We'll see what happens. Technically, that means he lost like $4 billion in the last three weeks. It's so nice. It's fun. (laughs) There you go. And in how to drag in your train news. Fantastic. That's the best. Thank you. Thank you. I was very proud of that. America's feeble limp towards high-speed rail is set to lurch a bit further forward this week when the privately owned train company Brightline breaks ground on a $12 billion project to provide high-speed rail between uh, Vegas and L.A., or nearly L.A. anyway. We'll get to it. Uh, the line Lay-ish. is set to open... Yeah, exactly. The kind of L.A. area, the burbs. Um, the line is set to open in 2028 uh, and will reach a top speed of over 180 miles per hour. That's about 290 kilometers an hour if you're a communist, making it the fastest train in America and the f- fucking 41st fastest train in the world. We're so sad. We, we fucking suck at trains. Yeah. We can't be the greatest country in the world without out maglev this should be easy to sell to republicans you just talk about like fear about the maglev gap and remind them about atlas shrug right. and all the trains and that it fucking levitates and it flies through the air yeah. it's amazing aren't you guys supposed to like old-timey shit okay what if we agree to power it with coal well, power <laughs> well it in with that coal. case yeah <laughs> that probably so, wouldn't well i guess you could have a maglev powered by coal <laughs> sure too. sure yeah so yeah, so so China has at least five trains that routinely operate at over 215 miles an hour and occasionally run over 250. America's current record holder is the Amtrak Acela, which operates in the Northeast Corridor and maxes out at a feeble 150 miles per hour occasionally, right? But not very often because it travels Just for a second. Yeah, yeah, right. It travels on the same track as fucking freight trains use, and you can't pass on a fucking train track. Plus, very few of those tracks are rated to travel at 150 miles per hour on. Uh, but between New York City and D.C., it just barely reaches the speed you need to technically qualify as high-speed rail. Okay, my 1984 Volvo 240DL four-speed wagon easily beat that train from New York to D.C., and I had a fire in my car <laughs> along the way I had to stop yeah. and put out. I think going 150 miles an hour might have had something to do with the fire, but <laughs> it's still a valid point. <laughs> So no, so that's the that's the gold medal holder. The silver medal for American trains goes to Brightline's very own Miami to Orlando train, which operates at around 125 miles per hour, which is a, a little faster than I've gone in my <laughs> Altima. Just a little bit, though. Um, but their new Vegas line is set to eclipse the current American record holder by an incredible 24% to the oh God. Ad- admittedly way faster than I've gone in my Altima, 186 miles per hour, uh, and will reduce the drive time from over four hours to just over two. Uh, except that it, like I said, won't actually go to L.A. It'll go to Rancho Cucamonga, which is like an hour out of central L.A. without traffic, which is a theoretical estate at best in L.A. <laughs> right, so that number doesn't matter. <laughs> right, yeah, no, so it'll it'll cut the drive time down from four hours to three hours plus traffic, assuming the train isn't delayed, which, come on, let's, we've been on trains. They, they often are. And look, I, I know it sounds like I'm shitting on this project, but I'm not. I'm, I'm shitting on the sad state of affairs that gets me excited about this project and makes it newsworthy. Right. We should have had this at least 30 fucking years ago. And the fact that we're still building it with the American taxpayer foots the bill and some private company reaps the profits model, whereby 25 percent of the cost of this thing comes from Biden's infrastructure bill is a big part of the reason why. But I'm happy that we're going to have it, especially if they really do get it done before the L.A. Olympics. But we could do so much fucking better. And the Olympics gave me an idea for what might just be the solution. All right. This is going to sound fucking crazy, but hear me out. Olympic train racing. Ooh. Right? Because American rednecks will sit idly by and let other countries reap the benefits in commerce and reduced emissions, but there's only so long that they're going to put up with coming in 41st place in a race against China. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Well, we'll have to accuse them of doping their trains. Well, right, right. Well, and they would probably be doping their trains. Right. Turns out they did it. Let's be honest. Just going around in a circle next to Ivan Drago (laughs) getting shots. (laughs) And in a weekend at Bernie's news. That's not a pun. That's just the name of the movie. No, it's a week a weekend. What? When Erica D'Souza Vieira. Wait, no, explain how that's a pun and not like just a the name. Week ending. Oh. That's what a weekend. What? <laughs> 
<laughs> because end, because the guy ends. And because he died. This doesn't count. It's a little advanced. Listeners, if you could explain to my amazing <laughs> word, please not. Uh, he's still weekend? looking at that picture of the popcorn bucket at the top of our notes. So he's <laughs> having trouble following along. When Erica de Souza Vieira wheeled her lethargic looking uncle into a Brazilian bank this week to sign for a $3,200 loan, tellers and staff became suspicious that the uncle wasn't all there, and so they filmed the encounter in a now viral clip on social media. Well, it turns out their hunch was right, as police reported this week that when Vieira helped her uncle sign that paperwork, he'd been dead for just <laughs> over two hours. <laughs> She's got a parrot doing his voice. Fuck, did I do the sketch wrong? <laughs> I feel like... How does it go? So, so it appears that Vieira was actually arrested on the scene, at which point police figured out she was trying to steal money with the dead guy mm-hmm. and charged her with violating a corpse and attempted theft through fraud, which makes sense because in the clip, the corpse is so very clearly dead, right? It can't hold a pen. And then the teller in the understatement of the century mentions that well, your uncle's looking a little pale and Pierre <laughs> responds, that's just what he's like, and then tries to put the pen in the dead guy's hand. Oh, she no. tried to put the pen back in his hand? What was she imagining as, like, the ideal win scenario here? Like, he'd, he'd still have one signature left in the battery, and it'd be fine? Right, yeah, it's right. Or, like, or barely even dead didn't count or whatever. So. Okay. So spoilers, Noah, because Vieira is claiming she's innocent. A lawyer for her case released a statement this week saying, quote, the facts did not occur as has been narrated. Paolo was alive when he arrived at the bank. All of this will be cleared up. We believe in Erica's innocence. <laughs> he actually, he already had those puppet strings on him when he died. He <laughs> liked she those. Found him. Those were <laughs> those for him. And finally tonight. In Deus Ex Machina news, Deus spelled like the comedy roast Deus is different. It's awesome. If if you had spelled mock with M-O-C-K, that would have been even better. But yes, it is pretty pretty I did. I did spell it like that. (laughs) Donald Trump. You should have tried weak. Donald Trump got roasted. (laughs) (laughs) Because roast in a Manhattan court last week. And Donald Trump, of course, got so fucking mad about it. In one of his many trials, the one in New York. No, the other one. No, the, the one about paying hush money to Stormy mm-hmm, Daniels yeah. and then falsifying records to hide it. Yeah, for that one, the jury selection finally happened last week. And that included an entire dedicated section of a hearing during which the roasty social media posts of prospective jury members got read aloud. And Trump had to just sit there and take it right in the face. And they, they should have brought in Eli to do the voices. He's right there. I mean, it's, he's just Thank across you. town. I could have been like the court reporter, but with me, me, me. Yeah, right. Instead. Exactly. It would have been great. <laughs> yeah. We'd have gone about the same. So part of the jury selection process involves each legal team making sure that nobody on the panel is unfairly biased against a particular verdict. So Trump's team scoured the Internet to find all the posts of potential jury members that reflected a negative opinion of their client. And when you take a random group of people in New York City or just about anywhere in the world, you're going to find lots of people who roasted Donald Trump at some point. The defense team flagged those posts and submitted them to Judge Juan Mershon. And in order to enter that stuff into the official record, Judge Mershon read out each one while Donald Trump just vibrated with rage. (laughs) Some of the posts were just basic stuff like get him out and lock him up. Another had side-by-side photos of Trump and Barack Obama with the caption, I don't think this is what they meant by orange is the new black. Phenomenal. And yet another was a video that had a mock lawn sign that said, I'm dumb as fuck, Trump 2024. (laughs) (laughs) And despite being told by the judge and his legal team to just sit there and shut the fuck up, Donald Trump got so angry at one point that he made a verbal retort yes. at one of the jury members after their post was read. 
And Judge Mershon gave Trump an extra scolding. Yeah, no, I love this so fucking much because Trump's made it clear that he intends to be present at every single court proceeding he can be present at, right? I, I guess he thinks this is going to better, like, bolster his claim that there's a witch hunt that's preventing him from campaigning or whatever the hell he's, he's claiming. But the odds that he can make it through that much court without breaking several laws and being held in contempt constantly are infinitesimal. Yeah, it's like the marshmallow test. But for a hundred million dollars. <laughs> well, yeah, and some of these and are criminal. And yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> so during the hearing on Monday the 15th, the day before the social media post reading, Trump's campaign sent out an email to all his supporters claiming that Trump had stormed out of court in a big act of defiance. <laughs> Except, no, he didn't do that at all. No. Because you can't just leave or you get in trouble. Mm-hmm. But... Following the roast hearing on Tuesday, Trump did storm out, but at the end. So that's not yeah, following from, yeah. from, from <laughs> there. Left the room <laughs> from there. He went straight to a, a bodega for a press conference where he told everyone that store owners should be allowed to have guns in order to murder shoplifters. Of course, he also claimed the whole trial against him is, quote, rigged. And and then he realized that he forgot to deny his own crimes and added quote and also there's no crime you know where the crime is in the bodegas where they come and rob them every week fucking that's a real quote by the way he's not uh, doing a bit he, he fucking he asked himself a question got stumped Right. About where the real crime was. He looked around and he basically (laughs) said hats, except he was looking at bodegas. Yep. And then he tried to buy an unpriced cliff bar and the owner told him it was one hundred forty (laughs) five dollars. The usual bodega experience. Yeah. Okay, And here's my favorite part. Just a little detail, but it's super fun. During all the hearings last week, Trump had a whole team of aides in the courtroom to perform a variety of, I'm sure, stupid tasks for him. One of those aides is named Natalie Harp, and apparently her entire job is to follow him around everywhere he goes. And she has a wireless printer that she just carries, I guess, and she prints out so-called good news from the Internet and hands Donald Trump physical pieces of paper to make him feel better about the good news from the Internet. Not clear what... Good news for Donald Trump would be right now, but that is her actual job. That's, that's her job. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, that's fucking unbelievable. I can't believe that's a real thing. <laughs> Amazing. This is in the world, and not just something you made up to fuck with us at the end. He here. is paying right. for that, or something I'm doing now that TikTok is banned. <laughs> <laughs> I have a printer for me. It's all the nice <laughs> tweets. All right. On that note. We're going to close it out. Thanks to No Illusions. Thanks to Eli Bosnick. Thanks to Natalie Harp for printing all that, whatever (laughs) she's making up. And thanks to all the listeners who liked us and followed us on all the various internets. Please keep doing that. Please keep listening and please keep telling your friends. And if you find the naive stupidity of our giving away a free show business model to be oddly charming, you can send us gifts of money at patreon.com slash skeptocrat. Just like It's Caroline, Brandon Ayers, Default Username, Major Boney, the Audio Mechanic, Dan's The Name, Pudding Trench, I.S., Paul Merrill, and Toxteth O'Grady, who all possess the enchanting animal magnetism of a golden retriever burrowing into your bed to wake you up. I got to experience that the last couple of days. It's the best. And whether or not you're feeling financially benevolent like those fine people, if you enjoyed our brand of whimsy and you'd like to hear more dick jokes free of charge, check out our brother and sister shows, The Scathing Atheist, God Awful Movies, D&D Minus, and Citation Needed, available in all the podcast places. We just have one last thing. Let's compliment that penis. Special thanks to Ryan Slotnick of Evil Giraffes on Mars. He's the creator of the virtuosic musical stylings you heard today, which were used with permission. You should definitely check them out using the links we'll provide or by Googling the only band called Evil Giraffes on Mars. Until next time, catchphrase sign off. Morgan? <laughs> Me? <laughs> you know, he wants us to keep rolling so that we can't make fun of him while he's going. That's right. So we, we, we talk to have a record. About him his tiny bladder. <laughs> <laughs> the preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle in a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2024. All rights reserved.